Well, I think uh, uh, there are three, four points that I will be making. Uh, one is that uh, capitalism is passing through a very difficult phase at the moment. Difficult in the sense that probably in times to come, it will not be recognized as capitalism. It will be something else. Second is that with this, we are also passing through a phase of dystopia. And uh, I'll talk about some novels, contemporary novels in France, Germany, Italy, in India, where dystopian novels are becoming very popular. And, and one of the reasons why JNU is being attacked, but I think JNU is the only utopia in the world of dystopia. And what these neoliberals really fear is the utopia. They don't want to, to make people aware of any possible utopia, be it Gandhi, be it Marx, be it anybody. So that's what is my larger argument. And this uh, liberalization and the privatization of education, this is, uh, I, I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. So let me first talk about the nature of capitalism that is changing. I think there's an ontic mutation going on in capitalism. What is it? The wealth is being concentrated in few hands. I don't need to give any data about it. This is well known now, globally speaking. If you look at the history of capitalism, the first phase of capitalism when it started, the legitimizing logic for capitalism was common good. No matter how Locke supported capitalism or Adam Smith talked about it, they all based their argument on the idea of the common good. Capitalism goes into crisis, and then again, welfare economics emerges, and the, uh, the central idea remains common good. Why do we need to reform? Because finally, the economy has to serve the common good. And capitalism is the best system to support the common good. In 1970s, the first mutation come, major mutation come, when the common good idea was abandoned. And the new idea was brought by people like Hayek and Friedman. The idea was that capitalism supports freedom. And now freedom became the common good. You all know about those theories, how they argued that freedom is necessary for creativity and creativity is necessary for <coughs> regeneration of economy and therefore freedom is the common good. The 1984 crisis, 87 crisis, not 84, 87 crisis has created, sorry, 2008 crisis, 2008 economic crisis has now abandoned even freedom as a foundation of capitalist philosophy. And there's no philosophy at all. There's no legitimizing philosophy of capitalism anymore. So you don't see any book coming out on why capitalism is a good system. In fact, those who were earlier supporting capitalism, they have started arguing that capitalism is not sustainable. Fukuyama, who was a great champion of end of history, is now arguing in his latest books that this is a very dangerous system that is emerging. People who argued for capitalism as the best possible system of economy, they are saying that it is no more capitalism, it is something else. So it is no more common good, it is no more freedom, it is a dangerous economic system. Why it is dangerous? For two basic reasons. One, that capital is being concentrated in some hands and centralized in some industries. So in the first world, what are they doing? They don't need labor power anymore to sustain their economy, to come out from the uh, capitalist crisis. Prabhat Patnaik has very well argued that crisis is not over, but trade unions are on decline. Therefore, there is no pressure from below for capitalist reform. And what the capitalists are depending on, they're depending on artificial intelligence and robotics. So there is a possibility that in next 20 years, or maybe 15 years, or maybe earlier than that, there would be around 70% unemployment in US. In US, remember. And what is the way out they're thinking of? They are suggesting that they would give basic minimum income to everybody. So that the basic market could be sustained and people would not revolt. But what are they doing simultaneously is 
that they are concentrating their capital on, on in the arms industry. And third world countries have now been given something called, something called security discourse. So our Prime Minister is very well talking about the security. And security is built in our system now. Gradually we have started thinking in terms of security only as a global phenomenon. Consequently, we will be the biggest buyers of arms from the first world. And then what will happen to us? The Indian state will squeeze all resources from everywhere to put in the arms industry. Either they will have the arms corridor, that's what UP has decided now, or they will buy arms, which you can see every day we are dealing with the first world buying arms. So gradually, education, health, education and health would be the biggest sufferer. So the crisis today is a part of this larger crisis. Now look at the dystopian situation that we are facing today. All over the world, look at, for instance, the French writer uh, Olbeck, Michel Olbeck, read the book Submission. It's a devastating book. But when I was talking to my French friends, they are saying that he has captured the psycho of the people, psyche of the people. There is that kind of fear that has been generated, which seems to be absolutely artificial fear. In fact, there was a novelist who wrote su such kind of thing, a Catholic novelist, in 1971. And that time, that book could not sell. In 2011 and 12, it has become the bestseller. Similarly, if you go to, I mean, look at Indian writings like Prasottam Agrawal's book, I don't know how many people have read that, called uh, Nakohas. Nakohas is a very interesting book, which actually talks about JNU. I mean, it doesn't take the name, obviously, but says that how in the universities there will be identity-based politics, and the state will use the identity-based politics to divide students, to kill all initiatives. You have, uh, I, I can, uh, the Italian novelist, Elena Ferrante. This lady has written three novels. You know about that, that nobody knows who is she. She doesn't want to give her name. And she tells how in Italian society, the utopia is dying. Or you take the Black Mirror. Many of you must have seen, I could not cross third or fourth episode. Have you seen Black Mirror? It's a terrible thing to see. I mean, if you, if you think that's the future of ours, it's a Netflix serial. It's, it's the future of ours. It would be a terrible thing to see. And there are many more. Laila, you must have seen. Laila, everybody has seen. So we didn't have sleep. I'm, I'm sure Amir has also seen that. I haven't watched it so far, but I'm sure. You have not. <laughs> you, you, you should not. You should not, actually. But if I can have nightmares after that, you will definitely have it. So there is a, there is a serious problem that we are facing that utopias are dying. And they want to kill all the utopias. In such situation, what is there to unite ourselves to fight against the state? The state has answer to every small or big question that we are raising. You can see that they have divided the population completely. You go outside the JNU, even with our friends, childhood friends, relatives, it is difficult to defend JNU since February 16, what was the date? By February 9. Since then, it has been very difficult to argue for JNU. What is their argument? For instance, on the fee thing, they will say, 10 rupees, 20 rupees, 300 rupees, kaun si badi baat hai? you don't want to pay 300 rupees? So the discourse has been designed in a way, I think, and I have definite information about this that six months before the government came into power, they were already designing this idea that the biggest enemy for them was JNU. They knew that they could kill all other opponents except JNU. And they were saying that we have to take care of JNU and it was all designed that way. The steps were already decided. I met somebody long in, in, a, uh, in a village far away from Delhi, an ex-principal of some a school, what is called Saraswati Vidya Mandir or something. And he told me, the moment he came to know that I was from JNU, he said that, well, we will finish JNU. <laughs> and I was surprised that a man in 
thousands of kilometers away from JNU, principal of a school is telling me that he would finish JNU. I said, why? What is the problem? What happened to you? He said, no, no, we have already discussed about it. I said, how much time will you take? He said, six months. I said, how will you kill them? Appointments first. And he has all the strategies. So it is well designed plan that, that was there. In fact, it was a kind of community of, peop, uh, uh, of upper caste where I was standing there and everybody was supporting him. So there was a debate between me and him. The only way I could put him down was that I asked him that, do you have any idea what is the difference between a school, Vidyalaya, Mahavidyalaya and Vishwavidyalaya? <laughs> so unfortunately, they don't understand the difference between Vidyalaya and Vishwavidyalaya. They think Vishwavidyalaya is well like Vidyalaya. So I asked him, why do you call them Vishwavidyalaya? It is the duty of the state to provide resources for research on the issues which could be important for humanity. Not only for the nation state, not only for the ruling classes, not only for the economy of the country, but for the humanity as a whole. Newton's law of gravitation is not important only for Britain. So I think this idea that JNU is a place of all kinds of wrong things is the idea that they wanted to propagate. They designed it. This is a design to kill the utopia. It's not only designed to kill JNU, it's designed to kill the post-independence utopia of India. What was the post-independent utopia? Post-independence utopia was that, well, every, every person would get equal opportunity in the society to grow. At least on education, the state can spend something so that there could be social mobility. And JNU on the scale of social mobility is the best in the world. And we, we might be second or third or fifth or 200th in terms of producing new knowledge. I can do it, I, I would agree with that. But nowhere in the world an institution has ensured the kind of social mobility that JNU has ensured. And that is the hope that gives the hope to Indian people that the state might create such kind of institutions one day where everybody and anybody could be educated. So to fight against this kind of capitalism, this kind of dystopia, I think JNU is the only hope. The protest will not be able to come from industries, trade unions. You know it fairly well now. Since last 25, 30 years, I think the site of protest has already changed. I remember doing a project in 2001 with John Harris. And the issue was that whether the site of protest had changed from industries to the colonies. And actually, we could predict Amadi Party that they will not raise issues of industries or workers. Rather, they would raise issues of governance and giving basic facilities to the colonies. That has already shifted. The hope lies with the universities. After 1968, many of the states experimented with open universities <coughs> so that there's no possibility of youth being in one place trying to create problem for the state. I think they are also interested in that. Now they are saying the technology is also available for that. They don't need a campus anymore. There is something called MOOC courses, I'm told. And very soon they will say that eight courses you can do from there and eight from here. We are also being allured, being offered money, lakhs and lakhs, six, six lakh or something, for one course. And continuous income will be there, apart from our salaries. This HRD, the HR, this is not HRD project, this is a World Bank project. I, I decided not to write for one of the courses that Ajay worked for. What was the course? Asutosh's course. E Partsala e is a World Bank project. Definitely a World Bank project. So they are trying to kill these campuses completely. They think these campuses are no more sustainable. Not sustainable only for the reason of finances, but also for the reason that there is a possibility of protest from there. Because the youth is accumulated there. They have some kind of utopia. 
and they can fight for the utopia. So this kind of campuses must end. I was discussing with a friend of mine who came from UK and working for some institute. I was mentioning that, well, it seems that the state is not going to give funds for education anymore. He informed me that, well, the institutes I'm going to, oceanography and all, they are saying they have no dearth of money. Huge fund is there. The next day he had a meeting in HRD and he came back and said that, look, there's a definite feeling in the state or there's a policy in the state now that they want to close down big campuses. They want to fund small centers. Because the small centers on the PPB model, they are manageable. And they think their productivity is more than the university productivity. Because the universities are difficult to maintain. Heavy investment also. Plus the political reason. Because the state is going to be more authoritarian gradually. There will be more squeezing of money from health sector and education sector. Be ready for that. So the fight against this, I call it fight for democracy. It is the moment to fight. If there is no global fight against this, then probably capitalism will move towards that direction, which will be very, very dangerous. As it has no ideology which can sustain itself, there is no legitimizing argument which can convince us that capitalism is good. Excessive consumerism, people are going to react now. I remember there was a London riot, and after that, some people were interviewed. And they asked, they were asked that, what do you think you should do now? They said, we should not buy now. We should withdraw from the market. Or after the Twin Towers collapse, Reagan came out and said that, go out and buy more. You have to catch those signals. These are the signals suggesting that capitalism is going to deep crisis. And consumerism is the only ideology through which it survives at the moment. And consumerism cannot be for long, a legitimizing ideology for capitalism. We all know that. So this is, this is a big crisis that is emerging. And I think there are only two fronts where sustainable political movements can be raised. One is the education, other is the health. These are two fronts where the state cannot deny its, its duty towards the people. Amadi party is already giving signal that how the health and education, these things are working very well electorally. If there's a nationwide movement, if there's a global movement for free education, I think that will really challenge, put challenge to capitalism. But they cannot do it. They will not do it. They don't need human labor, so they don't need to train you anymore. The investment that they're doing on you, they would rather invest on robotics. They would rather invest on artificial intelligence. Human beings are not needed for industrial production. I'm being told by the doctors that their job is in danger. Forget about political science professors. We can be replaced anytime through these YouTube videos. Not a big deal. The doctors and lawyers are being replaced. Major operative surgeries are being done now through robotics. So there is a big danger that human beings will be thrown out from the economic system. And there will be further squeezing of money by few people globally. So this fight against the fee hike in JNU should not be thought of only in terms of JNU. I think it's a, it's, it's a fight against the global system of capitalism, against the global exploitative system. And therefore, you can see the symptom that Pakistani students are suggesting that they, would, they are following JNU now. No wonder tomorrow the French student will come on the street and say that we are following JNU now. Unfortunately, they don't understand Hindi, so they are not understanding these things at the moment. If they understand Habib Jalib's poem, I'm sure the French students would come and start repeating Habib Jalib immediately. Somebody should translate Habib Jalib in the more popular French language. So Bangladesh will have this kind of movement. In India already, I, I, I'm talking to some of the people from Bihar. They are saying that there is a possibility that there will be a movement in behalf. And government is fearing that. It is not a joke that was being circulated on the uh, WhatsApp group that the, the Prime Minister fears a student movement as he himself was part of one earlier. The state is fearing today only the students. The state doesn't fear labor, 
They don't, don't fear professors. They don't need us at all. Even for winning elections, they need PK, not professor from political science. So they are not interested in our knowledge. The students can only fight against this kind of emerging capitalism. There is, there is a future to win. And therefore, to sustain this utopia of JNU is, is very, very important at the moment. I think between in, in the world of dystopia today, this is the only utopia that is sustaining us for long. And it will sustain us for long. And so fight against fee hype is fight for JNU. Fight for JNU is fight for utopia. Fight for utopia is fight for democracy. And fight for democracy is fight for humanity. Thank you very much.